Good afternoon. I am Juan Torres. I am internist at Hospital Universitario Infanta Leonor in Madrid. And I am chair of the IFM Ultrasound Working Group. It's a pleasure for me to be here in this webinar. And first of all, I would like to thank IFIM uh, for supporting this webinar, and especially to Aneta Trakowska and Delta Medical Communication for organizing this webinar. It was mid-June when the working group were, was trying to organize this webinar, but we decided to wait until we had a, something different and new to tell because there were a lot of webinars uh, at that moment and we decided to wait uh, until we had a uh, new information. And that's why we are here. We, got, uh, we bring experience and research to uh, show you. Uh, there are a lot of um, reports and guidelines uh, about lung ultrasound in COVID-19 but there's a lot of a lack of evidence related to it about the use and the utility of lung ultrasound, this tool in, in COVID-19. This is what we're gonna discuss and see this afternoon, and then we will um, talk about it. Let me introduce the speakers uh, who will uh, show us their experience and their research. The first one is Yaletung Chen. He's an internist from Hospital Universitario Puerta de Hierro in Madrid. Uh, in the first search in Mar March 2020, he was an attending physician at the emergency department of Hospital La Paz in Madrid. And uh, now is temporarily assigned to Hospital Isabel Zendal, a monographic hospital dedicated exclusively to treat COVID-19 patients. He has published a, a lot of papers about point of care ultrasound and especially in COVID-19 patients. And he became famous worldwide because while, while he was suffering COVID-19, he decided to, to make self ultrasound, lung ultrasound. And, and that information um, spread it uh, worldwide. And he appeared in on uh, social media and TV programs, including uh, CNN and, and others. The second speaker is Frank Bosch. Well, um, Yale will talk about uh, the examination protocol and image interpretations uh, of, of COVID-19 lung ultrasounds. The second um, speaker will be Frank Bosch. He's internist and intensivist is professor in acute medicine at two hospitals, UMCN San Rabud and Ringsted hospitals in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, he was president, he's been president of the European Federation of Internal Medicine, and he was the founder of the ultrasound working group at, at IFEM. He's been involved in treating patients, COVID-19 patients at the ICU during the different searches. And he's been involved in, in research about the diagnostic uh, capacity of lung ultrasound compared to, to other techniques, especially CT scan. He will talk about that talk. And finally, the last speaker uh, will be Chiara Cogliati. She is Associate Professor of Internal Medicine and Director of Internal Medicine Department at Luigi Sacco Hospital in Milan. And um, as you already know, uh, north of Italy has been one of the most affected areas in the world, uh, COVID-19 patients. Now they are suffering, I don't know if the third or the fourth wave. Um, uh, and she got a lot of experience treating that patients at the, the internal medicine wards. And she was involved in, uh, in very interesting research about the prognostic capacity uh, of a lung ultrasound in patients with COVID-19. And she will show us uh, their research and comparing it with the rest of the evidence in the literature. 
So uh, we can start the webinar and I would like to remind you that you can make all your questions uh, and remarks at the uh, Q&A um, place that you have at the bottom of your screen. At the end of the presentations, we will discuss all the questions that I think is one of the most important thing in, in webinars. Um, I hope that this webinar will be of interest for you, you, all of you. Thank you very much. Shall I start? Okay. Let's see, can you see the screen? Great. Uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers, to you, Juan, friends and colleagues. Uh, it is my pleasure to share with you one of my pa passions, hobby, and even you can say something that guided in my darkest times when I was sick at the beginning of the waves. Uh, what I'm gonna talk uh, is about the Lang ultrasound examination protocol and how to interpret the main findings. These are my disclosures. And of course, you need to understand uh, why lung ultrasound is so important in COVID by understanding what has COVID supposed to us all treating physicians uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, we couldn't otherwise interpret uh, why it has been so important uh, ultrasound. So with these numbers uh, and this type of uh, uh, figures, pictures, uh, this is uh, a hospital, Enfermera Isabel Zendal, an emergency hospital, uh, build it up uh, in a couple of months to treat only treat COVID-19 patients. We have uh, three main buildings with uh, each of it to, uh, with the capacity of 500 beds, even almost 500 intermediate uh, care, respiratory care beds and 20 uh, intensive care beds with intubated patients. And why, why I'm saying that it is so important to understand the context, because in this high uh, incidence, high prevalent uh, scenario, uh, anyone who comes with a, a normal lung ultrasound almost for sure will have uh, uh, COVID. And someone uh, with a normal, completely normal lung ultrasound, almost you could rule out COVID. That is not gonna happen all, all the time, but in this first, second or third way. And uh, let me show you, this is one of the first uh, protocols that uh, appear in my hospital where to manage uh, COVID-19 patients, you have to rely on chest X-ray, oxygen saturation, auscultation, and of course, PCR. If we take a look to auscultation, you could recall this uh, image from the beginning of the pandemic where they, uh, these authors were recommending to use this type of uh, um, rudimentary stethoscopes, where you, to be able to hear anything, you will have to be at least this close to your patients. Uh, a little bit uh, the longer is the stethoscope, but uh, compared with with what is the common uh, pro cord, which is uh, three times, even five times longer. And uh, how is auscultation in COVID? In this COVID-19 patient with uh, proven pneumonia, this was his auscultation. Believe me, completely normal. And on the other side, completely normal. The chest X-ray, normal as well. And the oxygen saturation was normal as well. Even more now that, that we know that patients with dark skin they can even have a uh, normal oxygen saturation with low PO2. And PCR, PCR, if we have the ones that we were using at the beginning of the pandemic, 
that that was almost like flipping a coin. The sensitivity was as high as 60%. And now we got a little bit better with a 70, 80%, but still far from uh, what we will expect to be a gold standard. And that is uh, why we have to look for other type of tools for geeks like us who love ultrasound uh, or mm, like in this picture, what will be the role of ultrasound in all this whole story? Well, from almost already 20 years, we know that ultrasound uh, performs much better with higher accuracy compared to auscultation or chest radiography in the pleural effusion, in uh, detecting consolidation or interstitial syndrome. Then to begin, how should be the lung ultrasound performed in COVID? If you haven't had chance up to now, uh, I, let me give you some hints that uh, it was useful to me and that is the protocol I follow every day in my workplace. Uh, First of all, you have to prepare yourself to uh, be safe. And for that reason, you need to put the personal protective equipment in order to scan your patients. And which ultrasound uh, machine do you use? Uh, many of us, we started to use the handheld device at the beginning, but uh, then you have also the car base as soon as uh, like uh, in my hospital or government I started to buy ultrasound machines because they found it to be cost effective. Now we have a card based machine in the COVID area, which is far more useful than using a handheld, which gives you a less accurate image uh, and uh, with uh, the limitation of the battery as well. And if you use a handheld device, usually what it is recommended is to put a cover sheet on it. Like in this case, I was using this picture was from April. And if you use a car based uh, device, which one would you choose? The one on the right or the one on the left? Definitely we will choose this one. Why? Because it has less buttons, uh, wheels, everything easier to clean. And uh, uh, if you get uh, also automated tools, much better. And uh, whenever you, you have the ultrasound machine in the COVID area, try to take off anything you are not gonna use for that purpose or that scan. That will be any other probes, uh, any uh, extra gel that you, that you are planning to use afterwards. So anything you don't need at that moment, take it off. Uh, because we know that gel, bottles, anything can be uh, a place where the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus can live up to three days, as we know. And uh, for the gel, uh, you can either have uh, bottles uh, of gel in the COVID area or if you don't have enough gel, I can imagine uh, that circumstance, you can take uh, some uh, individual packets to it. And this was my basin, my warrior kit in the, the beginning of April, May, where I went everywhere through the COVID area to scan my, my patients. So I said, uh, the cleaning is really paramount, very important. It might take uh, a little bit longer than we would like, but uh, why is it so important? Because we know that the virus can live uh, over the surface of uh, any place up to three days. And that is why you have to clean every corner of the machine, of the ultrasound machine. And in my case, uh, I've quantified it that it takes around 15 minutes to hold, uh, to clean the whole machine. And that is why it is so important to, if you can, uh, and you can ask to your, uh, um, uh, to the ones in charge in your department or hospital to have 
uh, isolated machine only for the COVID area. Um, what type of products do you use to clean it? According to the manufacturers, you can use uh, any low degree uh, uh, cleaner uh, disinfectant, which could be this vehicle or even this surface, which is the instrument that they use to clean any instrumental surgical uh, uh, tools that can work as well. And so it is the chlorexidine or and others. And in the, when you use a handheld device, you have to try to have uh, several basins where you can put the product to clean it, let it dry, and then another one to give it when it is clean in the clean area. As so goes for the uh, car base, you have to clean it once uh, when you go inside the COVID area, if uh, you are taking the, uh, the machine from the clean to the COVID, and then twice when you finish your scan. One, that you, whenever, uh, as soon as you finish the scan, and another time when you are in the clean area to clean it the whole machine again. And be careful, never, never use the same machine with suspected and confirmed patients. Whenever you switch from confirmed to suspected, you have to clean it uh, the same as if you were going to the clean area because you never know well, how it's gonna be. I've heard many colleagues that they have the ultrasound machine in, the, in a COVID area and they have the same machine for everyone who comes with uh, symptoms. And I think that's uh, something that we have to change uh, if possible. And how difficult it is to perform the lung ultrasound? Well, if you see the, uh, the evidence bef behind this, it's quite rudimentary. You, uh, to, uh, to do a lung scan, we all know it's quite easy. You just need to put the probe uh, over the chest and get, you, you will get a perfect image of what it will be this. What it is this, a transversal view of the, of the chest, of the lung. Uh, in this case, the, uh, we will get a tiny window that uh, for uh, the past, it was uh, the best way to get your lung scan. But uh, here in COVID, it, you get a broader view with much more information when you get longitudinal between the ribs. You get much more lung surface to analyze. And which protocol do you use? If we search the literature, I was able to find 10 different protocols just in COVID uh, according to the number of areas examined. You could have uh, 8, uh, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, and even 72. Uh, and then which one is the correct? Is there a better uh, ultrasound technique uh, in COVID? We didn't know. That is why we tried to analyze it. Uh, what we did was to design a protocol with 72 areas. That's one for each rib space. And we compared that to the 10 uh, uh, zones at each hemithorax, at each lung, 20 in total, and we tried to figure out which one correlated better to the degree of abnormality on CT. And uh, beware that lung ultrasound is not the answer to everything. As we know, there's certain lobes that don't touch the surface, the, the, the pleura. Which ones are the seven it at each globe, and there are certain lobes that only have a tiny window to the to the pleura, and that should be taken account because many of these lobes they will have a, a more a, a volume area in the inner part rather than in the surface. And in these different protocols, we've seen that uh, the one that correlated better with uh, the degree of lung abnormality was the 12 strong protocol, where we could get a high interclass correlation. Uh, and uh, as soon as we added 
more areas to scan, it didn't get better. So what could be that uh, the reason behind that? Because you uh, to see a diffuse disease like this that affects usually affects both lungs uh, just by getting an anterior, lateral, and posterior. Uh, especially if you get an inferior and superior window, it's more than enough to get an idea of what it is happening. And by adding more and more points, you will just get uh, a more tense, uh, a more longer uh, exam that doesn't add anything to the information you are already getting. And how difficult it is to interpret that lung ultrasound? Well, if we understand ultrasound, uh, as a decitometer, that will tell me more or less, like in this diagram, uh, if the lung is fully too much air is on it, or if there's a switch to the other side, too much water or less air is on it. And in the middle, we can get uh, normal lungs with uh, interstitial uh, abnormalities with uh, consolidations or atertasis. And the lung ultrasound will tell me, uh, like at the symptometer, how much air or the aeration is going to be that lung likely to be. And uh, as I said before, there's no uh, such thing as poor acoustic windows like we should, we usually we face while performing um, echocardiography or abdominal ultrasound, lucky for us. Which probe are we gonna use to do a long ultrasound? Uh, well, uh, you can virtually, you can get this image to, um, to interpret with almost any of these three ultrasound. Uh, probes. Only you have to take into account that each one of them, they will have uh, certain limitations that uh, just at the time of interpretation, but you almost you can get it with any of them. And as soon as you put it, the probe over the chest, you will see the skin, the fat, the muscular layer, the ribs, and in between the uh, pleural line which is an artifact. Remember that we are not seeing real pleura, just the artifact of the difference of, uh, uh, of impedance between these two surfaces. And if we have a fully aerated lung, we will get this artifact, the A-lines. This artifact comes from the, like when we face one mirror to another mirror, we have a duplication to the inf bottom of the screen of what it is in between it. And that's the A lines, the reverberation of the pleural line artifact up to the bottom of the screen. And what it is the B line, as soon as we, as we lose that air and something else is coming up like inflammation, water and congestive heart failure or fibrotic changes, we will start to see these isolated B lines or these confluent B lines or this light beam, which is a kind of uh, artifact of B lines with uh, which is hard to delineate and uh, is brighter. That light beam is said to be more specific in COVID than other signs. And see consolidation. The consolidation uh, you will see it better by looking at the pleural line. You see an hyperchoic uh, artifact and right in the middle you see something that is not that hyperchoic. That will tell you that something is going below that. Sometimes it can be hard to tell and other times it will be really easier to tell and even you will struggle to say if there's another liver or another spleen over the liver or, or which is the case of a, a hepatinization of the, of the lung. These are all uh, videos of COVID-19 patients. This one, one patient, we, of course, we were concerned of a sobrebacterial infection that she had. And uh, what, what is gonna depend to see a bigger or a smaller consolidation? If you get 
a pneumonia at that point and you put the pro, you won't get to see anything. Why? Because it doesn't touch the pleura and you need that, uh, that pneumonia to touch the pleura in order to see it. As soon as the inflammatory border touches the pleura, you will get to see some B-lines. The B-lines are a, an alarm sign that something is going on inside. It's uh, the loss of aeration, is the gain of fever, uh, fibrotic uh, fevers or, or could be uh, water, anything. And as soon as the consolidation touches the pleura, you will get to see that a pneumonia consolidation real lung. And uh, there are other two signs that you can get to see in the COVID. And a regular pleural line, which is not a thickened pleura, because as we said before, this is an artifact and uh, doesn't represent the real pleura. Actually, if you ask any of your radiologist colleagues, they will say that they uh, rarely, rarely see a thickened pleura in COVID. They will see some uh, uh, some pleuritic changes, but this is really hard to see. And even more in, on CT, as CT, uh, it's not the best technique to see the pleura. And uh, these are irregular, pre real irregular pleural line uh, in some COVID-19 patients that we correlated with the with the CT of this patient. As you see, it's much easier to see it on ultrasound rather than CT. And another uh, term that we have to take into account is that sometimes the thickened pleura will, uh, will uh, what it is really behind a thickened pleura is a pneumonia, a consolidation taking over. As you see here, you get to see a thickened pleura and then right below that, there's a consolidation appearing. And what about pleural effusion? Pleural effusion is something really common in COVID. Laminar pleural effusion. I have seen it tons of times in my patients. What it is not so common is to see big pleural effusions. When you get laminar, a small, really small pleural effusion, that's something common. But when you get something like that, uh, mild to moderate pleural effusion, you have to think of another the DC going on, like heart failure or anything else. And these are the different signs we can get in COVID. And uh, how can we quantify to use it to follow up? Well, there are several ways to use this. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were uh, almost certain that when you get these findings at the upper part of the lungs, would be more severe than get it at the bottom posterior lungs. Now we know that it's more a matter of time that you get uh, one or the other uh, as the first uh, abnormalities will appear at the posterior, but then they will progress uh, many times to the anterior. So it's hard to say if that it will make a difference at all. And uh, uh, what we use to quantify the abnormalities of the lungs is the lung score. And how is this score uh, made up? It's uh, from the artifacts that I find in each area. If I have A lines that will score as zero, irregular pleural line or isolated B lines as one, confluent B lines or light beam as two, and consolidation of pleural effusion as three. That will mark a degree of priority as a more aerated lung will have less priority and a more uh, consolidated with pleural effusion will mark a more uh, priority as it is this lung less aerated. So for instance, how do I get that score in that area in six? If I get an irregular pleural line, and a consolidation, that area will account as three. And now what I do is to sum up the 12 areas from a score to zero to 36. 
And uh, if you get a score summing the 12 areas between zero and seven, that will be mild, eight to 18 moderate, and eight, 19 to 36 will be severe. Uh, what about the more severe patients, the ones that are in ICU? Well, in these cases, long ultrasound is not that useful as we might think. In the, this is a paper we published a couple of uh, months ago where what we have to uh, remind is that we are not just exploring the lung, we are exploring a whole critic, severely ill patient where everything else will play a role as well. The, to examine the veins, the heart, the IVC, to assess the fluid, status, etc. So like in this case, this patient with multisystemic inflammatory syndrome didn't have any lung abnormality. Actually, his lung score was, as I recall, one, point of one. This had only one or two B lines in one area. But the heart, the heart, look at that. That heart is not, it has a low ejection fraction and uh, with really high uh, inflammatory markers. And this other patient had a pericardial effusion with uh, signs of, uh, of early tamponade. Or in this other case, with a big uh, uh, consolidation, which uh, made us concerned about a sobrebacterial infection. Or ARDS, where you usually what you get is uh, a good ejection fraction or even an hyperdynamic heart uh, with a low uh, uh, central venous pressure. And as we know, uh, from the pathophysiology, we have to take into account all these DVT, P as a cause of uh, deterioration in our patients. And let's not forget the consequences of therapy. In this case, uh, it is a video, it is running, yes, it's running. It's a, a pneumothorax caused by mechanical ventilation, viral trauma. And this is a colleague with uh, chest pain several weeks after having COVID. Uh, what she had was a uh, pericardial fusion and what she described was a uh, pericardial pain. Uh, so she had pericarditis as any uh, virus can cause pericarditis, acute viral pericarditis. So it is SARS-CoV-2. Some of the pitfalls we have to take into account. Uh, chronic heart failure will give us a picture, very similar picture. So we will have to rely on other uh, windows such as the heart to see a low ejection fraction or a high uh, central venous pressure. Or even if you take uh, with a little bit more of confidence or practice, you will see that the pleural line is usually a uh, thin in these cases. And so for PE, not PE after COVID, but PE usually when you find it as a, as a subpleural consolidation, usually it's not surrounded with abnormal lung, but from normal lung and sub -su, uh, isolated subpleural uh, consolidations that usually at that point, the patient will complain from pleuritic chest pain or malignancy, we have to rely also on taking a good history about my patient who had also a, a smoking, a heavy smoker in this case with uh, losing weight the several months before getting COVID. And even uh, let's not forget about other viral illnesses. Although we have experienced a really low incidence of flu, flu will give you the same B lines as subpleural consolidations, just like SARS-CoV-2. And if you ask any pediatrician, a colleague of yours, they will say that uh, SARS-CoV-2 will give you the same pattern as bronchiolitis. And at the end of the day, what does, what is the role of lung ultrasound? Well, lung ultrasound will guide me therapy. Why? 
by uh, ruling out other disease or by telling me that there's some comorbid disease going on as well. Also, uh, we know that, uh, as uh, Dr. Walsh will explain later, uh, it's, uh, it has a high uh, degree of correlation with CT, with high positive and negative predictive values, which will allow me in some instances, in some cases, to do follow-up with ultrasound and forgetting uh, uh, CT. And even with prognosis uh, use, uh, uses like uh, Dr. Cogliati will explain later. In our case, we found that we'll, uh, long ultrasound in some simple rules allowed us to predict mortality and even hospitalization. And that at the end of the day, uh, colleagues, is that uh, something that will help me to love even more ultrasound as a geek, as a, a preacher of long ultrasound. And to, to my take home message is that long ultrasound maybe seem easy to, to perform. And actually it's really easy to perform it. What it is hard is to interpret it as it is operator dependent as we always have heard of it. It's more accurate than chest X-ray auscultation. That's nothing new. We knew it for almost for 20 years. That is more accurate. And so is for SARS-CoV-2. Its uh, accuracy uh, might reach the level of the CT and in some cases may surpass CT, especially when evaluating assessing the pleural line. Only we will get to see the ones, the lesions that touch the pleura. And that's the uh, or lucky shot in this disease that affects mainly subpleural, uh, the peripheral parts of the lungs. And uh, the B lines. Uh, it's a sign of the irradiation and also a sign that something is going inside the lungs that will, uh, that will uh, allow, uh, hint me to look farther deeper inside. And uh, this is why lung ultrasound might work as a densitometer to tell me how much air water has my lung, how much inflammation is my, uh, how much inflammation is uh, my lung uh, in that stage at that point will allow me to get, if I get a, a good score, severity score, will allow me to, to monitor my patient at each treatment therapy step and to see the response to it. And uh, also for post-COVID uh, syndrome, to see the residual uh, changes, the fibrosis will allow me to take a look and to monitor my patients. And of course, it requires some formal training to uh, correctly interpret it. And this is my Twitter and my email address. Feel free to email me or to write me anytime you want. And uh, don't lose faith. We are almost at the end of the COVID. Uh, we have been struggling much up to now but just we are one step ahead to the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yale. Now we got Professor Frank Bosch, please. Thank you. Jorge, thank you, Yale, for your great presentation. Um, I think you covered some ground that I'm going over, but that's not a problem. Um, so the, um, um, I would like to talk about lung ultrasound. I would like to talk about the relationship between lung ultrasound and CT scanning. Um, and as I always say, get rid of the stethoscope because you don't really need it anymore. <laughs> So we're in the COVID times now, and I think that x-rays are still very often performed in COVID patients as part of a certain unnecessary routine. Um, and uh, we know, of course, from earlier uh, investigations that ultrasound performs way better compared to x-ray. This is a typical x-ray that you would get back from your radiologist. And had you performed an ultrasound, you would have seen the abnormality, whether it's pleural fluid or where it's a pulmonary infiltrate uh, far quicker. And actually, 
CT scan came up as very important in the COVID diagnosis. And there were first some studies from China. Um, and then later, uh, I think uh, the Dutch were the first, but I'm not exactly sure. They came up with a grading system, which is called the Korats system. And um, the, the, they made a grade between Korats 1 until uh, Korats 5 for uh, the risk of COVID. And um, this proved to be uh, to have a great relationship with the probability of having a, pos a, a positive uh, PCR test. So we use a lot of ultrasound and mostly in COVID times the linear probe, but not always. You can use a convex probe also, like Dr. Yali told us. And we're looking in normal pictures for the A line. And this is a normal picture taken with a, a convex probe. And we were talking about uh, handheld ultrasound versus machine ultrasound. And we have been doing a lot of investigation with the use of handheld ultrasounds. Because these machines, they deliver more possibility than the health, handheld ultrasound. But it's hard to get them between the beds if your patient has already been admitted. And it's very difficult to clean them. So we've used uh, several systems and mostly we rely on Butterfly, but sometimes we use uh, Lumify from Philips also. They have a couple of disadvantages that the image generation is not as great as the uh, card-based systems. But on the other hand, um, they're very uh, uh, useful. You can put them in your uh, white coat and you can clean them afterwards with just taking over an alcohol uh, cover uh, or a UV uh, machine, which we use at the Rothbard University, where you just put your probe in and it will be totally clean in 45 seconds. Um, and the handheld ultrasound has a lot of possibilities. Here you see a classical pneumothorax, where here you see the lung sliding, and here you see an, uh, an absence of lung sliding. So I think handheld is picking up pretty quickly. And I think it should be in every doctor's hands in the future. The COVID-19 image on ultrasound is comparable to uh, every other viral pneumonia. There's a thickened irregular pruller line. We often see B lines with inhomogeneous distribution. We see confluent B lines. We call it the waterfall phenomenon. We see some subplural infiltrates. And mostly there can be some, but very often there is no pleural fluid at all. And like Dr. Yali told us, if you find a lot of pleural fluid, beware, diagnosis may be something else. So this is a characteristic picture. You have already seen some of them. Here you see subpleural consolidation up here. And it is a progressive picture from normal A lines with a few B lines, a lot of B lines, and here a discrete B line, and here more B lines in a waterfall phenomenon. Um, furthermore, the subplural infiltrates can be pretty impressive in COVID patients. So in the Rothbard Hospital, we made two protocols. One was that we had a CT scan uh, put up at the entrance of the hospital and every patient who was referred to the emergency department with a suspicion of COVID uh, got a CT scan immediately on entrance of the hospital and the doctor who was going to visit this patient made a standard lung ultrasound scanning protocol. I will talk about it later, but basically it's the same protocol that Dr. Yale uses with scanning in uh, 12 lung areas. And furthermore, there were some patients where we visited them every day and performed the lung scanning every day to see whether lung scanning was useful for monitoring uh, uh, disease progression. And we used the lawn mower movement on uh, uh, six areas of the thorax on both sides. So basically we used 12 areas and we had actually the same uh, grading system that uh, Dr. Yali was, was referring to. Actually, I like this 
picture very much because it shows graphically the uh, the loss of aeration here and the abnormalities that you will find and this was already um, written in April in anesthesia by Smith et al. But in those times, those were just narrative reviews. There was hardly any structured uh, uh, investigation. So what did we do? We scanned every patient on entrance in the hospital. I have to be somewhat modest here because we could not scan every patient because we had to have a certified sonographer present and um, not, they're not always present in the middle of the night. And then we said, well, when, we, when do we call a lung ultrasound positive? We call a lung ultrasound positive when there are three or more B lines and or consolidations in two or more zones unilaterally or where there were three or more B lines or a consolidation in one or more zone bilaterally. And LUS was, uh, lung ultrasound was deemed negative when COVID-19 features were not found or just in one zone. CT scan was positive in the CORAL score of five or six, negative in one or two, and in the middle, well, it can be either. For our study, we considered them negative. So we published in uh, uh, ERJ open, and we uh, have to stress here that we are dealing with COVID-19 pneumonia in a pandemic setting. So like Dr. Yale said, almost every patient that came to the hospital in those days, there was the question, is this COVID, yes or no? <clears throat> so we scanned 189 patients. Actually, most patients uh, agreed. And 187 uh, patients, lung ultrasound were performed, CT was performed, and PCR was performed. And I have to stress, that the doctor who was performing the lung ultrasound did not know the result of the CT scan and the radiologist did not know the result of the lung ultrasound. We had 86 patients who had a positive PCR and we had 100 patients who had a negative PCR. We had a group of doctors, pulmonologists, infectious disease specialists and others who uh, uh, did not know our lung ultrasound results but they did know the CT scan results and they could give a diagnosis of uh, COVID even if the PCR was negative. And that is of course in the beginning of the scanning period where, uh, not every, uh, where we had not very good PCR scans. So here are our first diagnostic results. And you see, we compared lung ultrasound to CT and you see that the numbers are almost exactly equal. If we said this is a positive lung ultrasound, the chances that we would have a positive PCR were uh, pretty high. Um, and the same for the uh, CT scan, there was exactly the same cutoff. In the final diagnosis, some patients did get a uh, positive uh, result from the discussions. So we, uh, our lung ultrasound scan was extremely sensitive for a uh, positive PCR with a moderate specificity, a good positive likely ratio and an extremely good negative likely ratio. So lung ultrasound in our view has a, a very comparable diagnostic accuracy for COVID pneumonia during a pandemia. And lung ultrasound can safely exclude clinically relevant COVID-19 pneumonia and may aid COVID-19 diagnosis in high prevalence situations. So this is one study that we performed. If we look in the literature, we find more or less the same results. This is a study done by Sileskiewicz where they had uh, the CT scan compared to the lung ultrasound and they had uh, minimal damage on the CT scan severity and they had a low lung ultrasound score and in severe damage on the CT scan they had a high uh, uh, ultrasound score. So sorry these are the numbers uh, and they correlate very well. So um, if you have a low lung ultrasound score, we think that it's safe to send a patient home wherever he or she may live. 
if you have a high lung ultrasound score, the probability that this patient will end up in the ICU is pretty high. If you have an intermediate lung ultrasound score, the chances are that patient will be admitted, but uh, you have to do serial lung ultrasounds to see where that's happened, uh, what will happen with this patient. Um, we have looked at the uh, uh, lung ultrasound score and see what is happening with the patient. And you see that with a low ultrasound uh, score, um, the chances to remain free from death or ICU admissions are very high. And if you have a high ultrasound score, the chance that you will uh, die or end up in the ICE are far higher. Um, this is a study that is done in Sao Paulo, um, where they uh, concluded that lung ultrasound score predict outcomes in COVID-19 patients. So this is basically the same uh, results that we show in our study. So the group that dies has a very high lung ultrasound score, discharge alive has a lower ultrasound score, and patients who uh, uh, are released, they have low lung ultrasound scores. Um, so we are convinced that a low ultrasound score if measured in 12 lung fields, uh, confers with a good prognosis and with a very low score, you can even send the patient home. What we further investigated is whether it is necessary to perform a scan of 12 uh, lung areas. Um, a scan of 12 lung areas that takes around uh, five or seven minutes. So you can do it pretty quickly but might it not be possible to uh, scan fewer areas in a pandemic setting and conclude that the probability of uh, uh, COVID is very low. So what we did, we compared the uh, 12 uh, zone scanning with six zone scanning where we take the inferior lung points. And this also agrees with uh, Dr. Yale that the COVID pneumonia starts in the lower uh, lobes of the lungs. So we have concluded that if the lower uh, uh, scanning fields are free of COVID signs, you do not need to do the 12 zone scanning. If you find abnormalities, of course, in these lower uh, lung fields, you need to uh, enlarge the scanning and do all 12 zones. So we may conclude that in the COVID-19 pandemic setting, lung ultrasound is comparable to CT scanning in determining prognosis and in determining diagnosis. Lung ultrasound can help in triage of patients. Who can you send safely home? Whom do you have to admit? We think that lung ultrasound should be taught as an extension of the physical examination. Lung ultrasound is not only useful at the emergency department, but may also be very useful for general practitioners or in nursing homes uh, to determine prognosis and to determine who has to be sent to the hospital. Six zones can be used for screening. And in my view, handheld focus is here to stay. So uh, we take questions afterwards and I'd like to finish my presentation and thank you for the opportunity to present our results here. Thank you, Dr. Bosch, for your brilliant presentation and for adjusting the scale time. And now, Dr. Cogliati. Here I am. So it's a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Juan. Thank you to IFIM for the kind invitation. In the, these uh, 20 minutes, I will go through the um, evidences that are um, really uh, developing uh, in these last uh, months, even in the last uh, days, regarding uh, uh, the prognosis uh, and uh, language ultrasound in COVID-19. 
I um, excluded, I, I choose some papers to show you on the basis of the number of, of the studied uh, patients uh, and uh, also um, papers that shared uh, uh, the same uh, protocol uh, to be uh, comparable. And the protocol is what uh, has uh, already been uh, shown from Yalen, from, from Frank, uh, so a, a 12 area protocol. And I excluded also the uh, paper focusing just on ICU patients. So uh, minimal agenda, uh, we go through in which setting has been, has a, a language or sound study for, um, from the point of view of the prognosis and for which outcome. And uh, we, we will go through some methodological aspects. There will be some repetition, but maybe can, uh, can uh, be useful uh, again. And so uh, what about the emergency department? Uh, Frank, uh, Frank Bosch showed, uh, showed you the same, uh, the same paper just a few minutes ago, uh, the Brazilian paper. They conducted this paper in Sao Paulo in a COVID dedicated hospital. And um, uh, they had uh, as a primary outcome of that and secondary outcome were ICU admission and then the tracker intubation. Well, this was a, a pretty particular cohort of patients regarding uh, the uh, severity of the illness. Uh, there were uh, 180 patients with a mortality rate of 30 percent, 47 patients was already intubated at admission, and uh, uh, also P over F, uh, median value, witnesses the, 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 the severity of the, of the whole group with a median value of 120. Uh, they, uh, they showed that the rock curve you can see there, and uh, this is for mortality, for um, in endotracheal intubation, for ICU admission. And they uh, showed also uh, the association with outcome that was for language sound total score uh, with an odd ratio of 1.13, but uh, um, there, were, there wasn't a multivariate analysis. They um, adjusted just for age. And uh, so a particular setting with a pretty uh, severe cohort of patients. And the other one, um, the other one paper I, I want to show you uh, is not yet published. I can show you the results uh, for the courtesy of uh, Professor Perlini uh, that uh, gave me the, the definite uh, proof. The paper is accepted uh, uh, on internal and emergency medicine, but it isn't uh, available on the web. Uh, uh, now, and uh, the paper has been conducted uh, at uh, Pavia Hospital, University Hospital in Northern Italy uh, during the first, uh, the first wave of, um, of pandemia. And uh, they studied 312 patients, maybe the, the, the biggest one. And they had a primary endpoint of 30 day mortality. And uh, what about these patients? Uh, one third was, was discharged uh, from the emergency department at home. The mortality rate was 25%. And the severity uh, presentation was uh, um, very widely distributed. So the P over F mean value was a 306. And as you can see, with a very uh, spread distribution. And so what is generally seen in an emergency department of a huge hospital. And the author showed uh, the rock curves for uh, the total lung ultrasound score and compare with the rock curve of, of P over F values. And they said, okay, it performs better, language sound performs better with an area under the curve at, uh, at least zero point, uh, almost a 0 0.8. Um, but they do, did not um, consider in the multivariate analysis uh, P over F value as a confounder. They consider uh, biochemical uh, data. 
Um, more, uh, moreover, they uh, divided the patient, they, they did a certification, patient certification based on a lung ultrasound pattern, we can say. So no lung injury at lung ultrasound, the yellow line, or a prevalent interstitial syndrome or a prevalent consolidation syndrome. Uh, picture where the prevalent consolidation picture was defined as at least two consolidations uh, um, in a patient. And these are the Kaplan Meyer curves, and you can see the trends and uh, the difference between the prevalent uh, interstitial syndrome pattern and the prevalent consolidation pattern. Um, they uh, focused also on the data that uh, all the patients uh, they discharged that did not uh, uh, return, was not readmitted during the follow-up period, I had a lung ultrasound score um, under seven. And this is um, in, uh, in accordance what, uh, with what uh, Yale and Frank uh, told us uh, in the previous uh, uh, presentation. And what about uh, hospitalized patients? I selected some, um, some studies um, on prognostic value of loose uh, other than uh, the Frank uh, one because uh, I knew the, the, he, he was going to present it. And uh, this is a study uh, with uh, who presented the data on 280 patients. Uh, this is a Chinese studies, and um, this was a difference with the previous we, we saw for the emergency department in Sao Paulo. This cohort of patients was pretty uh, mildly affected. Uh, we can see a, a oxygen saturation of 98% for the whole population, uh, pretty young, 55 the mean age, and a mortality rate of 4% with an evolution to ARDS of 30. So another uh, little bit uh, atypical setting of mild patients. And they presented um, their data divided in stratifying patients by lung ultrasound score. And so uh, dividing for low 0, 1, so very, very low, moderate 2 to 12, and high uh, above 12 of lung ultrasound score. These are the rock curves uh, together with uh, the rock curve for age and lymphocytes. And these are the uh, data of the Cox proportional as a ratio where the, the author um, added as confounders uh, age, lymphocytes and comorbidity. But once again, uh, L uh, over um, uh, P over uh, F was not considered. And the last one I want to show you is a very, very recently published paper on the European Respiratory Journal. And uh, I decided to show you because uh, they repeated the uh, lung ultrasound uh, at admission at 48, 72 uh, hours after admission at, uh, and at discharge with the primary endpoint of death and ICU admission composite. They study 130 patients. Even in this case, a very low mortality, one death over 130 patients and 12 transferred to ICU. And this is a picture of the, the descriptive uh, data. So the lung ultrasound score uh, was not different uh, at the control uh, with respect to baseline and was uh, reduced as expected at discharge. And uh, uh, these are univariable and multivariable logistic regression. They use as uh, uh, as an index of a functional lung uh, uh, deterioration, the estimated uh, P over F derived from uh, oxygen saturation, not from gas analysis. And the results show the, um, the significance at multivariate analysis of lung ultrasound, uh, lung ultrasound score. Finally, uh, I show you our data. This, this study was uh, 
was conducted uh, during March and April 2020 in, uh, in our hospital, uh, Sacco Hospital in Milan. Sacco Hospital is a university hospital with a huge uh, infectious disease department. And so uh, it, it has always been considered a tertiary uh, reference uh, hospital for infectious disease. And uh, um, we uh, had these aims of the study to describe the language sound characteristics, to evaluate the predictive value of language sound for adverse events, ICO death as primary outcome, and need for CPAP ventilation as a secondary outcome. And the language sound was performed at admission and in a subgroup of patients after 72 hours. We used uh, the 12 area score, even though uh, we decided not to consider the anterior inferior, the left anterior inferior region, because in many cases, uh, this region uh, is occupied by the heart and the correct uh, evaluation is uh, often not allowed. And, and uh, we decided also to consider a different score, alternative scores, the anterolateral score, the number of positive region score to, um, to express the, the diffusion of the lung uh, involvement and the presence of consolidation, uh, considering, the, uh, considering at least one region uh, occupied by consolidation. These are the results in respect to outcomes. We studied uh, one, uh, 190 patient, consecutive patients and uh, we had the primary outcome uh, in 13% uh, uh, of the patient with 8% of death and 5% ICU, and the secondary outcome in 19% uh, of the patients. And uh, uh, these are the characteristics of our population a little bit uh, older in, with respect to other studies and uh, um, almost uh, um, around the 35% of the patient uh, had the P over F value uh, um, below, below um, 300. Here are the results uh, in respect to um, the different uh, uh, scores considered. First of all, uh, almost all the patients presented the pathological finding, and 96%. These were patients discharged from hospital with the diagnosis of uh, uh, COVID-related pneumonia. And uh, in the mm, great majority, the involvement was bilateral, 91%. Consolidations were present in one quarter of the patients. And in our cohort, the pleural effusion was pretty rare, around 6%. This uh, picture resumes uh, uh, the, uh, the results. Uh, you can see in bold uh, the percentage of patients with, po with uh, that positive region. And uh, in, um, in the bottom line, uh, the percentage of, pa of patients with consolidation present in that region. Uh, this data confirm what previously presented from my colleagues uh, this evening. And so that uh, inferior posterior uh, areas are the most uh, hit, hit uh, region and also consolidation are, um, are more frequently uh, localized in, uh, in this uh, area. And these are the uh, values of the results of the language sum variables in respect to outcomes of so the primary outcomes uh, um, uh, the first line and secondary outcomes, the second line. And you can see can, that uh, for all the different variables of language sound, the total score, the number of positive regions, the anterolateral score, and consolidations, um, there is a, a significant difference from patients who reach the outcome. Uh, uh, both primary and secondary, so both ICU death or CPAP in respect to patients who didn't. 
These are the results of uh, uh, univariate analysis and multivariate analysis. Uh, we uh, evaluated as confounder age, P over F, uh, Charleston comorbidity index, BMI, and hypertension. We decided to use these confounders because of uh, relevant evidence in the literature uh, demonstrating uh, uh, prognostic implication for these variables. And as you can see, uh, all the uh, all the language sound uh, variables, uh, but consolidation were uh, significantly uh, related to uh, to the primary outcome at univariate analysis, as were age. P over F and uh, comorbidity, but at multivariate analysis, only P over F was retained as uh, significant. For the secondary outcome, so the evolution of uh, uh, lung involvement, uh, the functional lung involvement with need to, to go uh, to CPAP support, all the variables uh, of the language of some variables were significantly associated with the outcome as uh, uh, P sub F in the, for what uh, related to confounders. And uh, um, these were retained by the multivariate analysis. And these are the results for um, a language sound performance at 72 hours. We performed this examination in 128 patients. And uh, almost uh, uh, half of the patients uh, uh, showed a worse total score at the second control. 30% an improvement and 18% uh, an unchanged language sound score. And, and you can see that the difference between, uh, between uh, um, patients who uh, reach the outcome, uh, uh, both primary and secondary, in respect to patients who didn't, are really, really um, important. And these are um, these um, these results are confirmed by the uh, univariate and multivariate analysis, and in particular, at uh, 72 hours, uh, the total score will be only one retained by the multivariate analysis uh, when considering the uh, ICU or occurrence of death. Uh, these are for the secondary outcomes: the CPAP ventilation and even in this case, ultrasound total score and PSUF were both retained at multivariate analysis. And um, finally, these are the raw curve. You can see for last for language sound at admission and the language sound at 72 hours. And uh, the, the area under the curve that are pretty good, in particular at 72 hours. And from this curve, we can derive that a total language sound score of nine at admission is a reliable cutoff value to rule out death and ICU transfer with a sensitivity of 100%. And when considering language sound performance after 72 hours, a cutoff value of 17 can actually predict the primary outcome sensitivity 89%, specificity 85%. So there are data uh, similar to what my colleagues uh, presented just uh, uh, just a few minutes ago. So some um, um, methodological aspects, I want to, to come back to the, the protocols uh, and uh, Dr. Tong Chen, uh, um, uh, very well explained the, the, the protocols, but there are still um, great, uh, great um, uh, differences uh, in, in uh, the different study and differences also regarding the, the, the transducer use, the system use as portable, as handled. And uh, uh, what about uh, the machine settings that in a lot of paper are not described and also the reproducibility. We test the reproducibility in our, in our, in our work by, um, 
by reassessing the score from just one expert operator so on 5% of the recorded loops. And for our that was 93% pretty good and some studies uh, some studies show this data but some other not so uh, i agree definitely with uh, with the paper that Gino Soldati published in journal ultrasound medicine just at the beginning of uh, of the pandemic asking uh, for uh, more standardization and i i have some concern for the the the, the details of the the um, of the protocol he presents, but uh, I as absolutely agree for the need of uh, a wider standardization of, uh, of language sound protocols. So uh, getting the conclusions, of, uh, how you, we can say there are growing evidences of a possible pronunciation role of language sound both in the emergency department and in the world. Some evidences indicate that the and ultrasound could aid emergency department physician in patient stratification for the most correct management. And uh, I agree with French, uh, with Frank, sorry, uh, regarding discharge or different intensity of care um, positioning in the hospital. In the world, the language ultrasound seems to be related uh, both uh, uh, with the outcomes in terms of mortality and morbidity. And uh, we show a partic in particular after the first days, its productivity seems to become stronger. And when assessing louder sound, I, um, I definitely think uh, um, that it's important to consider the potential confounders when assessing its prognostic uh, value. And in particular, we have to consider indices of functional lung deterioration to un better understand how language sound scores are independent predictors uh, of prognosis. Look to the future, just some suggestion I, I, I drive from all the things we, 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 we share today. Uh, we need more studies, more evidence, more standardization, meta-analysis, absolutely. And uh, regarding the utility of lung ultrasound, maybe we can uh, also uh, study something, uh, so a possible uh, usefulness of this fantastic tool in early recognition of lung injury for a possi possibly guiding therapy, maybe for indication of early therapy, and uh, also maybe for the uh, evaluation of lung recruitment. And I want to finish my presentation with two images. This is a, a woman um, uh, in uh, with the CPAP support in supine and prone position. Look at the huge consolidation and in the same area, uh, what happens to the same consolidation? Uh, what, 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 how is clear the recruitment due to positioning and how in this case, the lung ultrasound uh, can directly give us evidence of uh, of uh, what we are doing and what the effect of what we are doing. And so, oh, sorry. And so finally, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank you all the wonderful people I work with and in particular with these um, three wonderful uh, ultrasound guys, uh, Francesco Casella, the first name of the paper, Marco Barchesi and Federica Ledi. Thank you again. Thank you, Chiara. Now we got some minutes, minutes for our discussion. Um, I want to remind you that you can make all your questions in the Q&A uh, place at the bottom of your, of your screens. And I would like to, to start with one question for, for um, Giale about the lung ultrasound score. Uh, what do you think uh, about that score? It's only related to severity. It's related uh, to time of evolution of disease, both. Uh, what do you think about the number of regions affected? 
<laughs> well, how can I start to answer that difficult question? <laughs> Uh, there's no answer to that. I will say that Langscore is a, a aeration tool that is telling you how, how is the lung at that moment. I, I also, I will even say something something more that I might be criticized for that. I don't think Langscore right now at this moment is something that we can all use. Why? Because uh, you can correct me, but everyone is counting in a different manner. I mean, how do you count a small consolidation? Three. How do you count a big consolidation? Three. How do you count a small pleural effusion? Three. Then we cannot take in this DC with the same rules, tools we had before. We have to uh, standardize. It's really important. Dr. Corgliati said it before and uh, uh, Dr. Bosch mentioned also that we need to standardize and to have some uh, protocols and to have the same rules in this disease in order to get a score that is gonna be really useful. Up to then, we will still be mm, in a missed uh, road where what does in this patient a score of 35 mean that is probably is gonna be sick but how sick? It is much uh, worse, uh, probably a 25 score patient with big consolidations rather than some uh, small consolidations in a 35. That is my, uh, my interpretation to that. And uh, about the severity uh, and the evolution, I would say that uh, the main uh, value of ultrasound right now as we understand it, will be at follow-up. I have my patient, as Dr. Kogladi said, it's really quick to see the difference. When you get a patient in the prone position, you immediately, you see the recruitment of the lung, the aerated lung. So that will be a great value to explore that we don't have that data yet. May I add uh, something, uh, Juan? Or if, if there are questions from the audience, I, I would... There are some questions. Okay, I can. I can. Frank uh, could answer it. Um, one anonymous uh, in the audience asks, does lung uh, ultrasound have a role to check complications of COVID? Um, does it have a role uh, to check complications of COVID? Yeah. Well, um, I think Man. it has some role in uh, the development of COVID. It has some role in determining whether there is any venous thrombosis in the legs. Actually, we investigated that in the Netherlands and we scanned the legs of uh, 100, 136 uh, patients. And we found uh, um, uh, only six thrombosis in the legs. So it's not a lot. And I think this agrees with the literature. The probably most pulmonary embolism is, is, is originated uh, locally. Um, but those things we, uh, we, can, we can do, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, we have the same experience with uh, the with, uh, compressive ultrasound. We, we performed it consecutively and we found very few cases. And um, well, other complication, yes, for sure. I didn't understand it. just the thrombotic complication or any complication. Any complication. Uh, any complication. Well, yeah. uh, obviously, for example, uh, pneumothorax, as Yale showed us, pneumothorax is easily detectable as a complication, especially in CPAP or mechanically ventilated patients. And uh, there are possibly uh, recognizing uh, signs of uh, so over infect bacterial infection. The, the um, hepatization is not common in, uh, in COVID-19 uh, uh, lung picture. And uh, heart compl uh, cardiac complications are detectable by pocket, uh, pocket uh, point of care ultrasound, as Yale said. Uh, even if we, uh, we perform the consecutively uh, cardiac uh, ultrasound uh, in a group of uh, 70 patients, uh, and uh, we, we didn't find any 
difference uh, uh, in respect to severity or uh, new onset uh, cardiac, uh, uh, systolic cardiac damage or even uh, uh, pericardial effusion. I think maybe uh, I know that this- agrees exactly with our results. We did yeah. a lot of uh, cardiac scanning in the beginning of the first wave and there were no unexpected uh, uh, things on, uh, on the echocardiography. Of course, uh, the, the setting is very, very relevant because if you, if you look at the ICU patients, you have a lot of complications that are not COVID complications, that are ICU complications. And so uh, you can find their uh, heart, heart complicate, cardiac complication and abdominal complication and sepsis and so on. But uh, I mean, what is uh, COVID related, uh, uh, it's not so common regarding uh, the, kind of the heart, in my opinion. Okay. Another question. Um, uh, for Chiara, I think it's, it's the, but we, you all can, can answer. Uh, what do you think it's more important to predict the evolution, the global score or the score trends? Okay. Maybe serial ultrasounds. Okay, we, we address this, uh, this point. I, I had no time to explain on the things, but uh, thank you for this question. And um, we thought that the trend uh, was significant. But uh, what, we, what we see with the analysis is that uh, long, the total score is, uh, is the significant one and the, there was no significance for the trend uh, at 72 hours. The delta was not significant. And I think that from, that from this point of view could be relevant the fact that we, are, we have patients that uh, have a, a quite different distance from the beginning of symptoms when they arrive in hospital. And so the evolution also of the, of the language of sound pattern is quite different in the single patient. And that was also demonstrated when I, when I showed the data, the raw data of language of sound at 72 hours, half was, uh, were worse and 30% were uh, better and 20% were uh, stable. And so probably also because uh, uh, the, the, the evolution of the illness were different in the single patient in respect to the starting of symptoms. And especially in the, the first wave, we had patients that arrived at the hospital very, very late. What we saw is that uh, there is an evolution toward the consolidative pattern that at the beginning uh, you uh, often uh, has uh, interstitial pattern that can evolve into a consolid consolidative pattern. This is the same uh, you can see also in uh, bacterial pneumonia. If you perform language ultrasound at the very beginning or in the resolution phase, you can see a, a wider variation, so an interstitial pattern, and with the evolution of uh, pneumonia, you can find the consolidation. But uh, regarding prognosis, so we didn't find a significant uh, result for delta. Okay. Um, did you look at the, uh, what does lung ultrasound performed serially uh, add to the numbers of liters of oxygen that the patient needs? Does it give any added value? That's a question that I very often have because you can monitor the clinical condition of the patient also pretty early, by, pre, pre, pretty good by just seeing how much oxygen they get. Okay, another question for Frank. Um, given that you need to check 12 line zones to make examination, is line score applica applicable in the emergency department? Yes, I think so. Um, uh, it only takes a few minutes and one of the main advantages that I think is that you can continue to talk to the patient to take your anamnesis and to, uh, to, to hear what is going on while doing the ultrasound. And when you're using your stethoscope, it's hard to keep talking to the patient, you know, this doesn't <laughs> give a lot of information. So we, in our experience, uh, a long ultrasound of 12 zones is done, is done within five or six minutes, so you can easily
put it in your, but, but you need to put it in your workflow. What you should not do is go and talk to the patient, listen and have other ways to examine the thorax and then go back, grab your ultrasound probe and then investigate the patient. No, you need to put it, you need to take the ultrasound probe up front. I'm not sure if, any, if everyone agrees, but that's my approach at least. Okay. I agree. Are oh, you agree? Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's easy and, and it takes a few minutes. And another question for, for Yale. Is there a role in lung ultrasound for detection of lung interstitial sequela for post-COVID patients? I think you got some experience in that field, Yale. Yes, but uh, no extended experience as uh, uh, the ones that I got to see were the patients who were uh, still symptomatic after, uh, after 12 weeks. These patients, they, we could correlate the abnormalities in, in the lung ultrasound with the CT. Uh, so in these patients, uh, first of all, what I will do will, will be to rule out any other uh, sequela and then compare the findings I have it from other tests to the ones I get with ultrasound, and then uh, that uh, it is enough uh, to use lung ultrasound for follow-up as it is much available and easy to perform it, uh, as uh, Dr. Bosch said, with uh, the time consuming uh, uh, doing a CT compared to an X-ray or a, a lung ultrasound, it benefits far beyond with ultrasound. And we have several cases of post-COVID patients with some fibrotic changes that could be detected, easily detected with ultrasound, uh, thickened pleura, and also um, some uh, ground glass uh, opacities, they could be detected as B-lines, residual B-lines in uh, these patients. So this opens uh, a new role of ultrasound in the, uh, in the outpatient clinic for uh, post-COVID follow-up. And uh, we should uh, not uh, abandon uh, CT or X-ray, but uh, to look uh, ultrasound as a complement to these other tools that sometimes will be uh, with higher accuracy, more available, and sometimes will complement the other information. I wouldn't guide uh, the decision of how to treat a patient based only on ultrasound. And ultrasound is an anatomic, uh, uh, what it is telling you at the cytometry of that moment of the patient. You have to take account many more variables, not just that. Okay, and I think we got time for one last question for the three speakers. Um, the question from the audience is, if, if we use any decision algorithm based on lung ultrasound score for COVID patients in the AD, but I, I think the question is, is and you got to answer, um, if lung ultrasound changes in any way our uh, patient management. That's the question. How do we use the lung ultrasound for changing our management? Frank, for example. Respond. <laughs> well, I think it, it changes my management uh, pretty, uh, pretty much because I'm able already at first confrontation with the patient to determine whether this is a serious COVID or whether it is a, 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 a light COVID and patient can be sent home or patient has to be admitted. And I can determine that before I have the lymphopenia, before I have the lactate dehydrogenase, and before I have the CT scan. And I think this will change the management uh, pretty much. Furthermore, uh, at uh, Radboud Nijmegen, we have now uh, decreased the number of CTs that we're performing in these patients. And I think this is very good. So we, we do more on, on the ultrasound, yes. Chiara? I agree. I think that uh, I think that we, we, we need more evidences. <laughs> I, I I'm sure about it <laughs> because and also we 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 have some data that's important data and I agree with Frank. But uh, I think we need more evidences and it, it could be nice to 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 project to think about protocols uh, studying 
uh, definitely the, the, the land ultrasound guided management of the patients uh, in the emergency department, uh, a protocol, uh, a controlled protocol. This would be very, COVID, very useful. Even beyond COVID, I think. Yeah, even because, oh, absolutely, even beyond COVID, mm -hmm. even beyond COVID. Okay, Yali? Well, uh, I would say that point is <laughs> very... <laughs> that's why... That's why right now. Uh, <laughs> it's, the, it's the time, they are waiting. Dinner is ready. Right. Uh, no, uh, uh, I would say that uh, I, I, I use it and as more as I use ultrasound, I was, uh, I, I'm more lost about all the information we are now gathering and uh, all the messages we are listening. I'm more, I don't know if you have the same feeling of, uh, of losing the path and uh, being a little bit more uh, messed than the before. Uh, because now uh, you, sometimes you hear that sentence of, this is a crazy DC where it's uh, hard to interpret. Maybe we, we should wait to more evidence to come up to have all that and to have those meta-analysis and uh, be done to be really know what, what is gonna be the role of this, uh, of this tool. Cause right now, uh, really, I, sometimes we use the evidence that it is generated from previous experiences uh, and the little information that we are now receiving, we know that each one of us, we perform it in a different fashion manner and it is hard to interpret. So whenever I, uh, I talk about this topic with my friends, we, we hardly get um, uh, the feeling that as more you learn, more lose, uh, lost you feel with yeah. that. I agree, I agree, <laughs> Jale, but uh, this uh, is the same feeling for all the topics regarding COVID-19, not just lung ultrasound, it's just confusion. And I think that one year of a, such a confusion, it's really enough. We, we have to hope in some certainty, so collect evidences. <laughs> So there are more questions, but I think we have to finish with the webinar. Uh, I think that we can conclude that we know that lung ultrasound is a, an important tool for COVID-19 management, but there are lots of, um, of uh, research to do and we got a lack of evidence and we got to keep on researching. I would like to thank you for your brilliant presentations and your um, communications and thank you everyone. I hope that the webinar has been of your interest and I hope to see you soon. Thank you Juan and thank you. Bye. Goodbye Juan, goodbye. Thank you everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.